Okay, so we're now going to begin chapter three. Uh, let me put uh, just here at the top here a quick introduction to what chapter three is going to be all about. Oh, I forgot to put my thing on there. Chapter three, the whole chapter is now applications. I can write applications of derivatives. We have to assume now by this point um, that you can take the derivative of just about any function that we come across. So um, we've already looked at one application with the related rates. We're thinking of derivatives as rates of change, but we're going to expand our application of derivatives be beyond just the direct implied meaning of a derivative. We think of derivative right now in two ways. Derivative is either rate of change, one variable with respect to another. In particular, if the independent variable is time, then it's rate of change over time. Um, or we think of it as the slope of the tangent line, right? But there are things that we can use those concepts for, uh, and that's what we'll be talking about in this application. In particular, the main concept that we're going to be covering are what are called extreme values. Okay, Finding maxes and mins. And we'll talk about what we mean by that today. Okay, Then we take... Um, a little bit of an excursion, we'll, it'll depend on how much time we have today to do this, but we'll talk about a couple of very important mathematical theorems that come out of derivatives. One's called Rolle's theorem, named after a, a, a mathematician named Rolle, and um, the other one is called the mean value theorem. Okay? And if I were to make a list of my top ten favorite theorems or most valuable theorems that I know, particularly from my field of expertise, which is called numerical analysis, mean value theorem is definitely in the top ten. Not number one. Oh, you'll see number one by the end of calculus. Um, I think probably calculus two is when we talk about it. Um, but uh, there are some other ones in my top ten that are there just because they have cool names. There is the, uh, the ham sandwich theorem. Um, I already mentioned the wobbly table theorem, I think, in here once before. There's the... Uh, I don't know if I should say this name, but it certainly does have them. It's called the Harry Ball Theorem. Um, I throw those in the top ten just because it's got a cool name to it. But um, in terms of value, number one is what's called the Taylor's, uh, Taylor Series Theorem. Uh, but mean value, way up there. Um, anyways, moving on. We'll, have, um, we'll talk about the first derivative and second derivative tests. in this chapter. Um, we're going to be talking about limits at infinity before the end of this chapter is over, and we, we tie into this something that's actually, for some reason, I think misplaced in our textbook. We're going to introduce um, something called L'Hopital's Theorem when we get to that section, which is very valuable and important when it comes to finding limits. What I mean by limits at infinity is instead of taking limit as x goes to 2 or limit as x goes to 3, we're going to ask questions like, what is the limit as x goes to infinity? What is the limit as x goes to negative infinity? Um, that's the kind of question we want to answer. Um, we'll talk about optimization, which what optimization is, is it's a combination of extreme value theorem and the first and second derivative I misspelled derivative there, uh, tests in word problems, right? In actual real-world scenarios, we want to optimize functions, things like we want to maximize our profit or we want to minimize our costs when we're running a business. And then the last thing we're going to talk about are differentials, okay? All of that being the applications of derivatives that we want to cover in here. Now we're ready to begin, starting in section 3.1, talking about um, extrema of a function. The word extrema is probably not one we use in our everyday um, vernacular, but um, what we're trying to summarize with the concept of extrema is maximums and minimums. So if I said, what is the maximum of a function or the minimum of a function, I think you probably have a vague idea of what I'm trying to get at. And then extrema is just to classify or categorize both of those together. Think of all the highest points and the lowest points of a function. Those are going to be the extrema 
um, which, by the way, is the plural of extremum um, for a function. So I want us to consider three graphs. And think about what we might mean by the min and max of these functions. So um, let's say we're over an interval from A to B on each case, A to B, A to B. And there is some point um, C in the middle of them. I'll scroll down so you can see what I'm doing. Oh, too far. So let's say a function starts right here goes down, hits this point right here, and then comes up here. For that function, if I were to ask you what is the maximum or where is the maximum value of that function, which point would you say is the maximum? <coughs> it's this point right here, right? That's the max of that function. Where is the minimum? Exactly. Okay. The one thing we got to be careful of as we consider talking about extreme values for functions is does the function actually have a value at a point that looks like it might be the max? For example, let's say that instead of f, which in this case is continuous over a closed interval a, b, do you remember this notation? We introduced it before, and I told you I'm going to be using it a lot. We're going to use it in this chapter quite a bit. This means F is continuous over the closed interval AB. Now, if I were to put an open hole at A and an open hole at B and have a function that does this, let's say it's that lowest point right there, where is the maximum of that function? Well, there is no max. Because it only gets closer and closer and closer, but there is no single point where that function is defined that is higher than all of the others. Right? Because there's a hole there. Do you see my point? Yes, it gets closer and closer, and there is a value that this thing never passes, so it's not higher than that. But it is not actually a defined value of that function, so it has no maximum. Okay? On the other hand, it still has a minimum. In this case, I would write f is a continuous function over the open interval, a, b. Over here, the closed interval had a max, had a min. Over here, the open interval has a min, but no maximum. And I use max as an abbreviation for maximum. Hopefully that you know the difference between those two. It's just the same, actually the same word. All right, let's say we've got a function that is still defined at the endpoints, but what happens if there is a hole right there? Well, it still has a max, like it did in the first case, but now it has no min. And the problem with this one is it's not continuous. Remember, continuous, you have to be able, even if it has a value at C, in order to be continuous, you have to be able to draw the whole thing without picking up your pen. In this case, you can't, so it's not continuous. Okay, so there's going to be something special about this case that we're going to come back to, right, where this one had both a max and a min. This one had a min but no max. This had a max but no, no min. There's something special about this function that guarantees that you'll always have a max and a min. So let's talk about, in, in formal terms, what do we mean when we say something is a maximum or a minimum? So definition. This is my definition for extreme, extrema on an interval. So let's let f be defined on an interval containing the value c. So number one, f of c is called a or I should say the minimum 
of f on that interval i if f of c, the value of the function at c, is always less than or equal to f of x for every value on the interval. Right, this inequality that I have right here, which I'm going to highlight, this inequality says that you've got some function value that's below or less than every other value. So if we were to draw a picture like this, right, where we had this value right here, and say this was my interval, notice how that f of c is lower than everything else. All these other values, this direction and this direction, are above f of c. Okay, so that's that's what we would call a minimum. So how would you change this definition to say maximum? So same thing, <coughs> f of c is called the max max minimum of f on i if what were you saying? f of c is for every x on the interval. Exactly. So that's what we mean by a maximum. Is it's bigger, right? It's on the bigger end than f of c. Okay, sometimes note this definition also is used for um, absolute maximum or absolute minimum. Um, or even global max and global min. So the mathematical question to ask then is, all right, so we know what it means to be a maximum or minimum. And we've seen some examples above where we had a function that had a max and a min, a function that didn't. When does a function necessarily, necessarily have extreme values? Again, thinking back to what we saw at the earlier example, we had functions that did and functions that didn't. Um, in fact, I could easily draw a function that has neither. But the point is, is there some kind of criteria under which we're guaranteed to have it? And the answer is yes. In fact, it's got a theorem with a name. It's called the extreme value theorem. If I go too fast or um, you miss something up on the screen, just tell me to slow down. It's fine. So what is the extreme value theorem? The extreme value theorem says that if f is both continuous and it's continuous on a closed interval, then f will always has uh, an ex uh, sorry an absolute max and an absolute min.
So again, what does this say? F is continuous. Uh, contain what U O U S. Sorry, I can't write today. On this guy, meaning that you have to have continuous and you have to have a closed interval. So when you have a closed interval and the function is continuous, it has to have a maximum min, which, if you think about it, makes pretty good sense, meaning that if, if I've got a graph of a function and I know it's over an interval from A to B, which means it's defined at A, so it has some value here, and it's defined at B, has some value here. And the only way I can connect those two dots is by using a continuous curve. Now, continuous means I can't pick up my pen, right? Then I'm guaranteed to have some highest point and some lowest point. It could be that the highest point is at B and the lowest point is at A, something like this, right? So there's my max up here, and there's my min. Or I could go way up here, and so there's my max, and then my min is way down here at the left end. Or I could have something that goes crazy in between there. There is a lowest point here and a highest point here, but as long as I can only connect them with a continuous curve, then I'm guaranteed to have a highest point and a lowest point. Okay. Now, where could those highest points and lowest points occur? They can be at the endpoints, or they can be somewhere in between. Okay. Now, if they're in between, like this one and, say, this one, or at the endpoints, end point. The point here is that we're either going to have to find the value of the function at the endpoints or at these highest and lowest points inside. Now what do you notice about this guy inside here? What's the slope of the tangent line for this point? And this one down here? They have that in common, right? They both have that horizontal. Even this guy right here. He has a horizontal tangent line. We're going to see that that is important as we go forward. Now, in order to formally write out the theorem that says I'm always going to get a horizontal tangent line, I needed to make one more definition. And I defined absolute maximums and absolute minimums. We also have something called relative extrema, meaning a relative max and a relative min. So let's let f be defined on some interval i okay if say we have if there exists are you all comfortable comfortable with me using the backward z you know what that means right if there exists some open interval contained in I. So this may be a new symbol for you, so let me come off to the side here. This means here contained in. Okay? So let's say we have some open interval inside of I. such that C is in that interval. So don't forget this right here means is an element of. So I've got AB is some interval all the way inside. It's, it's some interval on which F is defined. And now I've got my C is somewhere inside of there. And now I can say if inside that interval we got some point and for at that point F of C is less than or equal to all other X's evaluated in the function, then 
Notice how what I'm actually saying is the same thing I said before about f of c. Only now the difference is I'm not looking at it over the entire interval. I'm only looking at it on some interval inside of there. Okay, in that case then f of c is called a relative minimum. I think I can draw a picture of this to help you understand a little bit better what I'm trying to say with this definition. Let me draw a function. Let's say the function is coming down, does this, goes up, and then comes back down and goes down forever this way. Okay, goes on forever in both directions. Okay, so in this case, my i is all real numbers, meaning that my function f is defined everywhere. Okay. Now, is this point right here an absolute minimum? Is it lower than every other point on the graph? The problem is these guys down here, right? Notice how they go lower than that. So that's not absolute the lowest that this function could ever be. This function goes down forever. There is no absolute minimum. What about this? Is this an absolute max? No, because we got the function going higher over here. Okay? Neither are absolute extrema. However, it is a minimum in the sense that it's a minimum of all the points nearby. So if I were to draw this, say, straight down and put a, an x value right there and do some interval around it, right? This is like my c, and this is like my a and b. So now, ignoring the rest of the function, look only on this interval right here. Now, on that interval, is that a minimum? Right? So because this function, all of these values inside here, until we get to right there, and until we get to right there, we would call that a relative minimum. Okay, It bottoms out somewhere. And the, the size of this interval depends on the function, right? If I had another curve, and you don't have to draw this one, but say it turned it back, down, back and forth really fast. Those intervals may have to be really small, but still that point right there is like a relative max, and this point right here is like a relative min. There's another relative max, relative min, max, min. Over some small interval around it, some neighborhood at that point, it bottoms out. It's the lowest within some interval. Okay? That's how I would write that. That's what this definition right here says. And in order to make that extend to um, relative maxes, I would say it the same way if there exists an a, b that's a subset of the interval i such that c is some point on a, b and now f of c is greater than or equal to all other values on that interval, meaning all other points between a and b evaluated in the function, if those are all smaller than f of c, then f of c is a relative max. Okay, so I'm going to highlight this in green and kind of make my point here on the screen by saying same idea that relative to its nearby points, it is a maximum. <coughs> That's why we call it a relative maximum. There is a, another term that's sometimes used, and the reason I only, only reason I point this out is because I might slip up and say this. They're also called local mins and local maxes, as opposed to relative. Local also is used in that terminology. Okay, now that we know what relative max and relative min are then we can now write down a theorem that says we know what kind of values 
um, are going to produce relative mins and relative maxes. There's only really two cases where you can ever get a relative min or a relative max. And they occur at what are called critical numbers. So several of your homework questions are going to ask you to find the critical number, so it's important that you understand this concept. Um, what I mean by a critical number is if F is defined, let F, sorry, be defined at C. If either the derivative of C, sorry, derivative of F at C is zero, or the derivative at C does not exist, all right, that's a backwards E line through it, meaning does not exist, then C is called a critical number or sometimes value. I may say critical value. The book uses the phrase critical number. Now what do I mean? If I draw a picture like this, say there's my function right there, this curve, here's my x-axis, this is my y-axis, and this right here is my function. Where is the critical number for that function? By the way, this is going down, I should be. It's where this corner is, right? What's the problem with a corner? Right, it does not exist, right? So right there is a critical number. What about on, maybe easier if I draw this curve in a different color. Where are the critical numbers for that curve? By the way, this is supposed to be nice and smooth here. Where it changes direction, right? This point right here has the property that it has a horizontal tangent. So there's a critical number. There's another one right here. Call it C2. Those are both critical numbers. So the key thing that you're looking for with critical numbers is that its derivative is either zero or its derivative doesn't exist. And the reason why we define this is because it turns out if you're going to find relative maxes or relative mins, relative max and relative mins always occur at critical numbers. It's the only place they will ever occur. Now, not every critical number is a max or min. Like we have here, both of these, all these critical numbers are maxes and min. But I could easily draw a function. Um, in fact, I'll draw it right now. Where you have a critical number, but you don't have a max or a min. Okay, where is a critical number on that curve? Right there. Agreed? Because what do we know? It's, it's a zero derivative, right? It's a horizontal tangent line, okay? Which means f prime of c is equal to zero, so there is a critical number. However, is that a max or a min or even a relative max, a relative min? And it's not, right? But that's not to say that what I said before isn't true. What I said before is that every max and min occurs at a critical number. Not every critical number is a max or min, but if it's going to have a relative max or relative min somewhere, it's going to happen at a critical number. So our strategy is going to be this. If we want to find all these extreme values, we're going to find all the critical numbers and test them to see whether or not they're maxes or mins. Okay? And we have basically three things we're going to learn in this chapter that allow us to do that. The first one we're going to cover in this section, I'll call this, uh, it's a theorem. Basically what I just said, if F has a relative minimum, 
or relative maximum at x equals c, then c is a critical number. The converse of that statement is not true. In other words, just because it is a critical number does not mean it is a max or min. All right, now I know I'm throwing a lot of concepts at you, but now let's finally actually do some of the type of problems you're going to be asked to do. You're going to be asked, given a function and a closed interval for that function, can you find its, ax its, its maxes and mins? In particular, its absolute max and its absolute min. Okay, so recall, just remember, I'm going to scroll up for, for just a second. I'll come back to this if you didn't get it written down yet. There's a theorem... right here that's very important. Whenever a theorem is given a name, that means it's actually more important than the rest of the theorems that we call it. This is a very important one. The extreme value theorem says that when you have a function that's continuous on a closed interval, it has a max and it has a min. We're going to use that, and I'm going to give you problems in your homework, and we'll do some problems here um, in our class of cases where we're guaranteed to have a max and a min on that closed interval. So let me write down an example. Let's find the extreme of f of x equals, let's do x cubed minus 3 halves x squared on negative 1 comma 2. First of all, is this function continuous? <coughs> okay. Analytically speaking, the way that we check for continuity is whether or not the function is defined over all those values, right? It, the types of functions we look at, they're discontinuous if there's a denominator equals zero or if you're outside of the domain, meaning you've got a square root and you've got negatives inside. So anything that's you know, not allowed for those types of functions, that's where we're dealing with discontinuities. In this case, no denominators other than the two, but there's nothing that would make that a problem. So this is continuous. This is a closed interval, which means we're guaranteed to have a highest point and a lowest point for this function. Okay. So now using that fact and using the theorem that we just came up with that said that we can find these relative mins and relative maxes inside the interval using the critical numbers, then what our strategy is going to be is this. Strategy is one, find all the critical numbers. That is set f prime of x equal to zero and find where f prime of x doesn't exist. All right, so anywhere the denominator, sorry, the derivative is zero or any place where the derivative doesn't exist, I should say that, solve this together. Set f prime of x equal to zero and solve. And secondly, find where the derivative doesn't exist. You're going to find a set of numbers here. It's places where the derivative is a horizontal tangent line, or whether it has corners or the derivative doesn't exist. Then, the second thing you do is plug in these values into f, 3, plug in the endpoints into f, and last of all, the least of these is 
the men. And the greatest is the max. That's a three. <laughs> Just can't tell. So in essence, what I'm going to try to do here, give me just a second to scroll up, I'll scroll right back down. Looking at this picture that I drew earlier, where I had several different choices of types of functions I could have. Again, I'm guaranteed to have a max somewhere. The way that I'm going to figure out where the max occurs and where the min occurs is I'm going to find the function value at the endpoints, and I'm going to find the function value at every one of the critical values in between. And then I'm going to plug all of those points into my function f. And whatever the highest value I get is, is going to be the maximum. And whatever the lowest value I get is, is going to be the minimum. So in order to apply this strategy to this function, what's the first thing that I need to do? Find the critical numbers, which we do by finding... So we need to find F prime. In our case, now we're back to just taking the derivative with respect to X of something that only depends on X, so we don't have to worry about the implicit or the relative rate stuff. Right? This is just going to be 3X squared. Right? Bring the 3 out front, drop that by 1, minus... Help me. Now what do I do with that? Set equal to zero. All right, how do you solve that equation? Okay. In fact, I can take a 3x out too. Yeah. You're left with x minus 1 equals zero. So 3x equals 0, x minus 1 equals 0, so x is 0 and x is 1. Now which ones of these are, are both of them inside the interval? They, they both are, aren't they? Okay, so they're both inside the interval, so we'll use both of them. Is there any place where this derivative is not defined? There's no denominator, so there's, yeah, and it's no square roots or anything like that. Okay, so step two and step three is to plug in x equals zero, x equals one into f, and we're going to plug the endpoints, x equals negative one and x equals two into f. So I'm going to build a table over here of the different values I want to plug in. This is how I do my extreme value theorem. So plug in 0, meaning into f, right? What is f? f is 3, no, f was x cubed minus 3 halves x squared, right? So you plug in 0, you get 0 cubed minus 3 halves 0 squared, which is 0. I plug in 1 into my function. I get 1 cubed minus 3 halves times 1 squared, which is 1 minus 3 halves, or negative 3 halves. Are you following me? I'm just plugging in my critical numbers and my endpoints all into f. Negative 1 was the other endpoint from the original problem right up here, negative 1. And here's 2. 
You plug in negative 1, you get negative 1 cubed minus 3 halves times negative 1 squared, which is a minus 1 minus 3 halves, which gives me negative 5 halves. And you plug in 2, that's 2 cubed minus 3 halves times 2 squared, which is 8 minus 2 squared is a 4, or divides out to 2, so minus 6, which is 2. So where is the max? So f of 2 equals 2 is the maximum. Where is the minimum? What I mean by max, we're looking for the highest number over here. Min is going to be the lowest one, which has to be right here, right? So f of... Negative 1 is equal to negative 5 halves. There you go. Does that make sense? The way that we find our absolute max and absolute min when it's a function that's continuous over a closed interval is set the derivative equal to 0 and find anywhere the derivative does not exist. Plug all those values in and the endpoints. The biggest is the max, the smallest is the min. Okay. Let's do one more example before we call it quits. I think we've got just enough time for one more. There are some other examples in your book, so you should read through those if you uh, have any trouble. But let's look at um, 3x to the 2 thirds minus 2x on negative 1, positive 1. Step one, find the derivative. Can you tell me what the derivative of the first term is? Two. X to the negative one third, very good. Minus two. Okay, so this looks like two over the cube root of X minus 2. So what do we do with this? All right, start by setting it equal to 0. So let's, uh, I'll tell you what, let's add 2 to both sides. So you get 2 over the cube root of x equals 2. Multiply the x cubed across, we end up with 2 equals 2 cube roots of x. Divide off the 2. Gives me cube root of x equals 1, which means x is 1. That was where we set f prime of x equal to 0. Where does f prime of x not exist? Well, look at uh, the derivative, which is right here. x equals 0. x can't be 0, right? Or it's undefined. Okay, so our critical numbers are x equals 1 and x equals 0. Don't forget to check where the derivative does not exist, because that's also a critical number. So now let's build our table. What are all the numbers we're going to plug in for x? 1, 0, negative 1, and 1's already in my list, so I don't have to do it again. f of 1 
is 3 times 1 to the 2 thirds minus 2 times 1. 1 to anything is 1, so that's 3 minus 2, which equals 1. 3 times 0 to the 2 thirds minus 2 times 0 gives me 0. And 3 times negative 1 to the 2 thirds minus 2 times negative 1 equals. And if it helps, don't forget, 2 thirds means negative 1 cubed and then, sorry, squared and then cube rooted. Which means cube root of 1, which is 1. So you get um, 3 times 1 minus a minus 2 makes plus 2 or 5. So what's the max? This one, right? So f of negative 1 equals 5 is the maximum value of that function. It occurs at x equals negative 1. The maximum value of the function is 5. What's the minimum? f at 0 is 0. We found the highest and lowest values for that function. Now where this is going to come into play in the real world, I mean in terms of word problems and application, we're going to come back to later on in the chapter when we do what are called optimization problems. But we're going to talk about you know, maximizing volume, maximizing cost, maximizing profit, or minimizing cost, or minimizing the amount of area and minimizing the amount of material used to make a box. Those are all extreme value questions. Finding the maximum value of a function or minimum value of the function. Now, also, the other problem we have now is that this technique only works on a closed interval. What if the function is not defined on a closed interval? What, what can we do to answer that question? If it's not over an interval, maybe it's over the entire real number line, we have a problem. We can't just plug in endpoints. So, what we're going to then do is develop what are called the first and second derivative tests. Okay. Now there is a homework assignment over this section. It is posted. I went ahead and put 3-1 with 3-2. I'm going to go back and delete 3-2, so you only have to do 3-1. The homework is not due until after the test. Okay. So 3.1 will not be due until a week from today, which is Monday. Okay. But you should be able to do all the problems from 3.1 now. Now there's a chance we'll skip over 3.2 and dive straight into 3.3 next time. Um, next time being Monday, Monday, but we'll talk about that when that rolls around. Good luck studying for your test. We'll see you next time.